Hey everyone, so look, we, we need to have a talk about guns and about gun laws. The tragic deaths in Las Vegas, we're seeing a lot of people posting and politicizing about this topic. There are lots of people giving out prayers and well wishes, and then there are others who are like angrily repudiating those well wishes, saying that, you know, that isn't working. And then you also have individuals who may border those two lines who just really want to see change, right? People who are tired of seeing just about as many mass shootings as there are days in a year. There are a lot of emotions going right now, and, you know, there should be. What happened was horrible. The, the tragic deaths of all of these people uh, who were just trying to enjoy themselves at a concert is just, it's just horrible. But it's in moments like these that it's important that we also have to kind of take a step back and not let emotions dilute the facts. So that's what we're going to do today. We are going to have a conversation, a factual conversation, about the nature of gun violence here in the U.S. and around the world. First off, study after study shows that gun violence is like mind-bogglingly high here in the United States. One study comparing us to 35 other wealthy nations found that it is about eight times higher in the United States than it is in those other places. And then a separate study comparing 23 uh, wealthy nations found that it's about 6.7 times higher. But when you look at just gun homicides, it's like over 40 times higher here than elsewhere. So in this regard, I think the Onion article that's been kind of populating everybody's news feed really sums it up best. That's not to say that it's equally bad everywhere, right? There is variation within the United States, and that variation largely has to do with the nature of gun laws in the states. Those states where access is less have fewer gun-related deaths among children, including for suicides. Another study found that fewer children are admitted to the ER with gun-related injuries. Another found that, you know, homicide rates aren't really too widely affected. It's slightly better, although not too, too much in those states with more restrictive access, but the gun suicide rate is worlds better where there's more restrictive access. It's not like every study published on this is all going in one direction. There have been some mixed results as there is in any sort of scientific discipline. So Australia, for instance, did not actually see a statistically significant decrease in their suicide rate when they implemented more strict uh, gun laws. In fact, they actually started to see a decrease in the suicide rate a couple of years before the implementation of the law. So it was more of a cultural shift as opposed to a legal one. Uh, moving back to the United States, the reduction in firearms is not statistically significant in terms of reducing the amount of deaths caused between strangers, although it is statistically associated with reducing the number of deaths caused by individuals who know each other. But in general, reduced access to firearms both here and abroad tend to cause significant declines in suicide, both those that would be caused by a gun or those that would otherwise not be. People don't just shift to doing another method. Sometimes suicide decisions are much more impulsive. Restricted access also decreases the proclivity for mass shootings to happen, as well as cuts the overall homicide rate by drastically slashing the number of homicides caused by uh, firearms. And I can say the word generally in this regard because yes, there has been a meta-analysis on the topic and those were, you know, its general findings. Although the mass shootings one does come from a separate study. The links for everything that I mentioned here are going to be down in the doobly there. But Peter, you may be thinking, what about Chicago, right? Where it has very, very strict gun laws, but also a massive amount of gun crime. What about Switzerland, where you have a plethora of weaponry where everybody, every male over the age of 20 has a weapon and any female volunteer also has a weapon uh, issued to them by the military, but their rates of crime uh, are much lower. These are the most common examples brought up in defense of the sort of statistics that I was just bringing up, but let's go ahead and dissect them a bit further. So while Chicago's laws may or may not be restrictive depending on who you ask, the whole situation isn't one that's particularly restrictive because you could literally just go the next county over, buy a gun there, and then come back over. So the laws are kind of a moot point in the city. With regards to Switzerland, international studies found that they actually had a very high rate of suicide and the reason was, you guessed it, the firearms. A study found that when the military decreased the availability of firearms in the country, that the number of suicides went down statistically and substantively significantly. You know, just in general, we have to stop thinking about gun violence as something that we can only enact onto other people as opposed to also being something that we can inflict upon ourselves. However, there is an imperative fact that cannot go ignored in this whole conversation, and that is in the United States, it is a constitutional right for an individual to own a firearm for self-defense. Courts ruled in DC versus Heller, as well as McDonald versus the city of Chicago, that the states and, you know, cities can cannot substantially and unilaterally restrict access to firearms uh, that would otherwise be used in self-defense. It is a constitutional right guaranteed by the Second Amendment and then uh, expanded to the entire nation's population uh, through the 14th. This is something that's definitely unique to the United States in terms of, you know, more advanced and wealthier countries. In fact, there are only two other countries in the world that have constitutional guarantees to firearms, and that would be Mexico and Guatemala. 
Regardless, gun ownership is a right guaranteed by the Constitution that people have the liberty to be able to practice should they choose so, so no. Banning firearms is probably not something that's even tenable or even should be done, at least in my personal opinion, until you have a constitutional amendment. Look, I'm gonna kinda tip my hat here and betray my biases. I actually don't hate guns, right? My father is a gun owner. A number of my mentors throughout life have been gun owners. Stephanie and I have been talking about purchasing a firearm for the usage of home defense. The reason that we haven't yet, though, is because one, we're waiting to afford the gun, which is surprisingly expensive, despite being a supposed constitutional right, but we also want to be able to afford the classes that would, you know, give us more than just the scarily bare minimum level of competence and safety with the firearm than is required by law. We also want to make sure that we have access to a gun safe that would both balance ease of access in a worst case scenario, as well as making sure that any future children we have could just not have access to that thing, period. There's a lot of considerations at play here, as there should be on the national level. But despite my personal affinities, right, something needs to change. And the overwhelming weight of the scientific evidence says that the most efficacious change comes through somehow restricting access to firearms. Now look, because again, I don't hate guns, I'm not saying that restriction necessarily means that a banning of like firearms or shotguns, rifles, or anything like that. It's possible to be able to restrict access without necessarily, right, banning things. Like in Israel's case, right, they managed to cause a significant decrease in the amount of suicides caused by young teens by restricting uh, soldiers from taking their issued firearms to the house, so that way the soldiers could only have access to any firearms that they had acquired uh, through attaining an individual license as opposed to just the gun that they were given uh, by issue of the military. You could also look at Austria, which didn't ban guns, but, you know, restricted the access to licenses by increasing their standards, and that caused a significant reduction in gun crime and in suicide. It's going to take some creativity, but I have faith that we'll be able to find a way to balance our Second Amendment rights with the other prerogatives of the Constitution, you know, namely securing the general welfare and the right to life to all citizens. I have hope that something can be done that balances safety with liberty, because as Las Vegas showed us, and as Pulse last year showed us, and as the other mass shootings, the number and number and number of them have showed us, something needs to. This is obviously a very weighty issue with a lot of emotions running deep throughout it, so I want to thank you guys in advance for staying civil in the comment section. And I really want you to take advantage of the comment section because I really want to know your guys' thoughts about this, because it's really important that we have a dialogue regarding gun rights and other stuff like that in the United States, and it's one that we need to have from people on all ends of the ideological perspective, right? Those who really, really, really love guns, like more so than I may do, and those who, you know, personally find them to be totally distasteful. As long as we have a earnest and respectful, factual uh, engagement, it's something that we need to have, because again, something just needs to happen. So let me know what you guys' thoughts are down in the comments section below. Links for all the studies that I referenced will be down in the doobly-doo. I apologize, but many of them are going to be locked behind a paywall, so if you have some sort of institutional access through either university or something like that, I highly recommend, you know, linking them, checking them out for yourselves. They are, you know, it's, it's important to be able to familiarize yourself with this sort of scientific literature on the topics that you're interested in. I don't necessarily want to close out with my usual, if you enjoyed this video, because I don't necessarily think that one could enjoy uh, a video like this, not in the sense of traditionally enjoying it. So I'm kind of actually reminded right now of that Matthew Inman comic that talks about, you know, if one is happy versus one is fulfilled. Um, because right now, I don't really particularly feel very happy about having to have this conversation, and I don't think anybody would be happy having this conversation either, but I hope that if you are fulfilled by the nature of this conversation, that you give this video a thumbs up. If you want to support the channel and, you know, videos that are both, uh, necessary like this, as well as those that are legitimately uh, enjoyable, which we have plenty of here, uh, you can do so by sharing this video, by commenting down below, and by clicking the subscribe button to stay in the loop for more social science content is uploaded. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, look forward to seeing your comments, and I'll see you next time.